Hello, I'm Nairi Creed. I'm the Director of Communications at the Australian Institute of International Affairs and I'm delighted today to welcome Dennis Richardson, who is a Fellow of the AIIA and the Secretary of the Department of Defence. Dennis, thanks for joining us for your Pleasure, time. Nari. You're a busy man, I know. Let's talk about uh, the White Paper on Defence. Mm -hmm. How is that progressing? Pretty well. Um, there's been a very systematic uh, process within government on that. That started uh, around the middle of last year. Uh, we're on track to complete that around the back end of August, uh, thereabouts, um, where there's been an external panel headed up by Peter Jennings of ASPE uh, reporting independently to government on the white paper. I'm pretty satisfied with the way it's progressed. It's been led uh, across government by Peter Baxter, uh, who's a, uh, his deputy secretary here and who's been doing an outstanding job. The idea of someone independent looking down from a different <coughs> level, is that um, a new strategy for the department when you're preparing such an important document? Oh, yes and no. Don't forget the uh, previous government's white paper in 2013 had an advisory committee which was independent of the department, consisting of a, of a couple of former secretaries of defence. Uh, Peter Jennings is not looking down from a different level, he's looking from a different perspective. Mm. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I, I think uh, any advice you give to government today is contestable. It certainly should be contestable. And uh, if uh, government officials, departments are put off by independent, um, uh, you know, uh, independent eyes questioning where they may be coming from, then they probably shouldn't be in government any longer. The White Paper will set a strategy for the next 10 years for the Defence Department? It looks out over the next uh, 20 odd years. Um, various assessments have been done looking out 20 years, which is, of course, uh, you certainly can't be dog dogmatic when you look out 20 years. There will be a 10-year capability plan uh, as part of the White Paper. Um, there'll also be a defence industry plan. All that's, you know, so it'll be quite a mix of stuff revolving around the White Paper that will come out. Given that there are regional conflicts, smaller conflicts, larger conflicts, that can come up quite quickly, uh, how can a strategy going over 10 years account for that and allow for that, those conflicts to just develop like that? Well, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't seek to be dogmatic or seek to be prescriptive in terms of detail, uh, what a white paper does is provide the policy framework uh, within which you make decisions about your force structure. As part of the white paper process this time, uh, there's been a force structure review, that is, what should be the structure of the ADF going forward. The last force structure review that was done was in 2008, clearly uh, seven years down the track, getting on to six years, uh, getting on to eight years down the track, there's a need for another one of them. Uh, so the white paper will provide the framework within which decisions are made about the structure of the uh, of the of the ADF. The ADF is a dynamic entity. Um, under what circumstances would you be able to um, include that in your in your forward planning, in terms of the the changing culture within the ADF, the inclusion, for example, of more women? in senior roles, it's, it's a dynamic structure. Oh yes, but I don't think that, I don't think that affects 
the fundamentals of the kind we're talking about here in terms of capability. Um, all roles in the ADF, including combat roles uh, in the ADF, are now open to women. Uh, there has been very significant cultural change in the ADF. The ADF leadership are very much committed to it. And if you look at the growth in the number of women and the percentage of women uh, in the ADF, uh, it's at an historic high. Uh, I think for Navy Air Force it's up around 18% uh, or so. Uh, Army is around 11, 12%. It's not where the ADF want it to be, uh, but they have very definitive plans as to how they'll grow um, the percentage of women in the ADF over the next 10 years. It's a simple question with probably a complicated, complicated answer, but what are the major challenges that the Defence Force, the Defence Department, is looking at meeting through the white paper and maybe even beyond that 10 years? Well, when you say challenges, we have internal, external, it depends how you want to carve up the cake. Uh, we, the government commissioned a first principles a review of the department uh, last year. That was headed up by David Peaver, a former managing director of Rio Tinto Australia, uh, who was about to take on the chairmanship of the Australian Cricket Board, which I think is a far more important job than Rio Tinto. And harder, possibly. Uh, and, and, and certainly harder. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, that review had a range of people on it, <coughs> including Lindsay Tant, a former finance minister in the, uh, in, in the Rudd government, uh, Robert Hill, a former defence minister under John Howard, uh, Jim McDowell, a former CEO of BAE Australia, and Peter Lay, a former uh, chief of the uh, uh, chief of the army. Uh, that uh, that review team reported to government in April. Uh, there were 76 recommendations, uh, all but uh, well. All but four of those recommendations were accepted outright. Uh, three were accepted in principle and one will be subject to review uh, in another 12 months. Uh, the changes recommended there add up, I think, probably to the most far-reaching changes in defence uh, over the last 40-odd years. Um, and we're going to have self-evident big management challenges. Uh, we have downsized in the Defence APS by 3,000 in the last three years. We'll be downsizing by another 1,000 over the next 12 months. That's got to affect uh, your capabilities, surely. No, well, at the same time, uh, we need to implement the first principles review. Mm -hmm. Uh, which involves bringing the defence materiel organisation more closely into, uh, in the, into the department. It involves changing the skill mix in the workforce. And when you're seeking to do all those things and you're also going through downsizing and you've got these enormous mega projects to manage, our biggest single challenge over the next few years is going to be to keep the show on the road as we manage in all these all these changes. Uh, and then of course uh, when the white paper is um, um, is is finalized uh, and is out, uh, there will be a big job of work in in following through on the implementation of the white paper. Uh, in terms of regional engagement, in terms of uh, adding substance to the capability plan and the like. So we've got our work cut out for us, but that's what we get paid for. 
Let's turn to uh, a current story, of course, which is the Chinese redevelopment mm -hmm. of some of the islands and the reefs in the South China Sea. The land reclamation. The land yep. reclamation. The minister has said, has expressed Australia's concern in an international forum about that. What are our concerns about that? Well, uh, look, I've got nothing to add to what the minister has already uh, put uh, on the table and to what I myself said in a speech a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, we think it is quite legitimate uh, to ask the purpose and intent of the land reclamation, noting that uh, it is uh, on a scale and at a speed beyond uh, multiples beyond anything we've seen in the past. Um, uh, our own position in respect of the South China Sea has, has, has been uh, consistent now for some years. Uh, we don't take a position in terms of the competing claims. Uh, we, do, uh, we do want the parties to resolve their differences peacefully in accordance uh, with, uh, with, with international law. Uh, and we will continue to work with ASEAN um, and, and others in, in, res in respect of that. We obviously have an interest. About 52% uh, of our merchandise shipping exports go through the South China Sea, so we do have an obvious interest. We're part of the region, so we uh, have an interest from that perspective uh, also, but uh, I don't think it's possible to add add anything to what's already been said previously in terms of quote concern unquote. As a middle power between China and America, how effective can we be within ASEAN and outside of ASEAN? Oh, I, I think uh, we have pretty good relations with both. Uh, with with China, uh, with all the ASEAN countries we do. We're of course in formal alliance with the United States. Uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with China uh, we do have some differences. Um, that's something which successive Chinese and Australian leaders have always noted and acknowledge. That does not, us, uh, that does not prevent us advancing the relationship. Uh, uh, for instance, only yesterday we had uh, we had uh, we had uh, the trade minister, uh, trade minister Rob, uh, and his Chinese counterpart uh, sign the free trade agreement, which had been in negotiation for many years. The CDF and myself uh, have an annual senior level defence dialogue uh, with our Chinese counterparts. Uh, so, uh, yes, we, we, there are areas where we do have differences, but uh, we also uh, work closely with China um, and, you know, we will, you know, China is a very important relationship uh, for us, but that does not mean that we won't have differences of perspective from time to time, and I think mature relationships understand that and can accommodate that. Dennis, thank you for talking to us today <clears throat> and being so open. Yep. Good luck with keeping the show on the road. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not quite sure what that sounds like now. <laughs> Good luck with keeping the show on the road. <laughs> we will keep it on the road. <laughs>